Okay, so we're going to be looking at the distortions of perception, uh, which includes visual illusions, judgment of flavours, and synesthesia. So the distortion of perception. Most of the time, our perception of the world closely matches the physical environment around us. However, this does not mean that perception is always error-free or perfect. We sometimes make mistakes and experience perceptual distortion. So, perceptual distortion, and remember, you're copying down what is in yellow. So, a perceptual distortion involves an inconsistency or a mismatch between a perceptual experience and physical reality. So, make sure you use those words. You need to have an inconsistency and mismatch between perceptual experience and physical reality. So, what you see right, and what is actually real are two different things. They don't actually match up. So visual illusions demonstrate cases in which reality is uh, misperceived for no immediately apparent reason. So if you happen to look at figure 8.1 here, the lines actually appear to be wonky, right? And that they're going off in weird and unusual ways. But if you actually look closely and put a ruler up against it, all those lines are actually straight. And that's because there is a inconsistency between what you are seeing and what is actually reality. So a visual illusion is a consistent, and make sure you put an underline under that one, so a consistent misinterpretation or distortion or mistake of real sensory information. So it's going to happen every single time you look at it, no matter, you know, you may know that those lines are straight, but you're always going to be seeing them as wonky. Right, so it's consistent. It is an experience uh, in which there is a mismatch between our perception and what we understand as physical reality. So once again, they've used that word mismatch. You may want to make sure you underline that one as well. Every time we view the same sensory information, we have the same illus uh, illusory experience. So in other words, you will always see that illusion no matter what, even though you know that it's an illusion. So, for example, here are some visual illusions that you may want to take a closer look at, right? You've got this Fraser spiral here, and you'd think by the way it's actually presented that, you know, it's actually spiralling down, but they're actually, you know, circles. They don't actually spiral. And then you've got the Zollner illusion. All these lines look like they're, you know, on angles, but they're actually all straight, apart from ones going horizontal. All right, then you've got the Orbison illusion. The small inner circle actually looks like it's been misshapen, but the reality is it's actually a circle. Um, the horizontal vertical illusion, um, the horizontal line actually looks like it's shorter than the vertical one, but in reality, they're exact same length and height. All right, the herring illusion, it kind of looks like these t these lines here are, you know, bowing out, but the reality is they are just straight. And it kind of looks like this line here is not going to line up with this one, but it actually does. If you put a line there, it actually does line up. All righty. So one of the most famous um, illusions that we talk about in psychology is what's known as the muller liar illusion. And you do need to know this, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, make sure you do it. So, let's have a look at figure 8.4. A and B, this one, A, looks a lot shorter than this one here. It looks like it's smaller. However, they're actually the same length. So, if you happen, so despite the fact that uh, you know that they're of equal length, and I'm telling you that they are, um, they don't look equal. Your distorted perception has been caused by the configuration of lines that make up the mule liar illusion, an illusion that has attracted a great deal of research by psychologists. So if we happen to look here, this is A, and this is the outside of buildings. The inside of buildings, right, give the impression of size, right? And that's what you see here. So it's named after Franz Müller Lyer, um, who originally described it in 1889. The Müller Lyer illusion is a visual illusion in which one of the two lines of equal length 
each of which has opposite shaped ends, is incorrectly perceived as being longer than the other. And you may want to highlight this particular section as well, because once again, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, you need to know what the mole liar illusion is. All right, so there are different ways to actually explain the mole liar illusion. All right, so the first one uh, is the biological perspective. So they emphasize the role played by our eyes, brains, and or nervous system when we viewed the illusion. So the eye movement theory, and this should probably be highlighted, um, proposes that the arrowhead and featherhead tail lines uh, require different types and or amounts of eye movements. Because the entire feather tailed line in the illusion is longer, it lengthens the eye, movements required to view the line. Therefore, we perceive the line as longer. So when we're looking at, and I do apologize, my drawing is going to be terrible, right? So if we look at it this way, you start, you know, you'll look at this line here, you'll look at this line here, and then you will see these ones, right? But your eye stops at this point, right? So your eye stops there. However, if we were to do the other version, which is this way, so in theory, the line's the same length. Let's pretend that I actually draw it right. All right, so because the line is that way, our eye doesn't stop till there. So we automatically think that this one is longer. And the eye movement theory suggests that it takes longer for us to look at this one, so we automatically assume that it's bigger. All right, does that make sense to everybody? I hope so. All right, so we perceive this particular line as longer because it takes us longer to look at this section as well. All right, this section here, it, our eye stops here. All right, so here are a few more examples of the more liar illusion. From the psychological perspective, so some explanations from a psychological perspective emphasize the role of learning and past experience. For example, it's been proposed that we experience the illusion because it contradicts what we have learned throughout life about physical reality. Therefore, we cannot make sense of the illusion whenever we view it, even after the illusion is explained to us. So, even though you know that it's the same length, you'll still perceive it as being longer, despite the fact that you know it. Um, and, yeah, it contradicts what you've learned throughout life. However you still will see it the way you see it. So another way of looking at it is from the social perspective, and they look at more of the cultural side to things. So as Europeans or descending from European countries, we tend to actually view, you know, the Mulai illusion to a lesser extent than those would, than those who are perhaps non-Europeans. And this is because of the fact that um, we are constantly surrounded by this particular illusion. You look around your room right now and you'll see, you know, the interior. So the small line with the, um, the outstretched arms and you're more likely to be seeing it everywhere. However, if you go to... Um, if you, you, sorry, if you happen to actually meet somebody from a non-European background and most commonly they've done research in, um, in countries such as Zambia and Namibia where they have more of the rounded huts and they're not used to, you know, the horizontal lines of a building. They are actually very more, they're very much more susceptible to the more liar illusion than what we are because they're not exposed to it. So they actually see the illusion um, a lot better than what we do. And they will always see it as um, one is longer than the other, no matter what. So another illusion that uh, is very, very apparent is the Ames Room illusion. And I'll even put in a link so you can make your own. 
I know some of you did it before when you had me in other classes, but the Ames Room Illusion is a trick on the eye. This is the exact same room. So the person on the right appears to be bigger than the person on the left. However, both people are actually of normal size. This illusion involves people appearing smaller or larger depending on where they are standing. It is based on the unusual construction of the room, particularly the shape of the back wall. So this is what it actually looks like. So if you can see, and I'll just put the note on, right, if you can see, it's actually higher here. Right, so you as a viewer and the cameraman would actually just look through this little hole here. Right, and you'll notice that the length of this particular section is smaller than this section here. So if actually this bit here is coming closer to you. And remember when we looked at the depth cues um, and relative size, the objects that are closer are going to appear bigger. So this back wall is actually on an angle. So it looks like it's straight because the floor gives that impression and it looks like it's the same size because the um, these back windows help you to give that perspective. However, everything in the room is off. And if you ever get a chance, and at this current point in time, it may not be for a couple of months, um, Amazing Things has an Ames room in it. And as you walk up, you actually appear to get bigger. I'll even put a link in to show you where to go. So the Ames room involves a trapezium shaped room that is longer and higher on one side than the other. When viewed through a peephole at the front of the room using only one eye, so monocular vision, the room appears rectangular. The room's unusual shape and being restricted to the use of monocular vision to view it provides the basis of the illusion. So you can see in this picture here, the room's not a rect rectangle, but it gives you the impression that it is, right? But it's actually quite weird the way it's set up. All right, so we're going to be looking at the judgment of flavours. And this comes back to... Um, Taste perception. So the perception of taste is a relatively limited experience that is based on five basic taste qualities. When we taste, what we actually perceived is combined is the combined input from t different senses, not just taste and other oral sensations. This overall experience results in flavor. Flavor is not the food or drink is created from the food um, by the brain. Flavor. Uh, tells us whether the food is delicious, good, unpleasant, or even disgusting. Flavour is a perceptual experience produced by a combination of taste and other sensation. A, compo a crucial component is smell. Think of it when you last had the flu or a cold and you had a stuffed, blocked nose and when you ate something, you really couldn't taste it. It's the same sort of thing. Right, so if you block your nose and eat something, there's a good chance that you won't be able to taste what you're eating. You may want to give that a go. All right, and here's a little experiment that you can do at home, and you can actually do it at home because I don't need to bring any food in and all that sort of stuff. So what you do is you have, you know, a cotton, some cotton balls, some vanilla extract, and you can get that from the cupboard. Your parents should have some if they're cook, if they're bakers, um, and an apple. So what you need to do is take a piece of apple and note the taste. And you can take, it'll taste like an apple, funnily enough. Now put a few drops of vanilla into the cotton ball. And you could use a tissue, whatever you have at hand, whatever works for you, right? Now put the cotton in front of your nose and eat another piece of apple while smelling the vanilla. Actually work out, it's, the apple's going to taste different. It's going to taste weird, trust me. So give it a go, and it doesn't have to be an apple, it could be, you know, an orange or something like that. Apple's just easier, um, and it is very clear as to what it's going to be tasting, what, you know, it's like. So we're going back to perceptual set. And so perceptual set is the flavour we experienced, um, is influenced by expectations based on preconceived ideas about how foods and drinks should taste. These form through past experience. 
So what you've eaten as a child will most likely influence what you eat as an adult. It is not even essential to have actually tasted something for to have an expectation of that flavour. For example, the mere thought of eating a live cockroach is likely to disgust you without knowing what it actually tastes like. So just viewing something. So even watching that man uh, with a cockroach on his tongue, that's just wrong. Right? Blue chicken, not cool. All right. So what influences our perception of food? So colour intensity. And you'll remember that I talked about that brighter orange juice tends to be perceived as being, you know, more flavoursome. It's the same sort of thing. So colour tends to dominate over other sensory information when it comes to influencing our expectations about taste and flavour of food. In addition, changing the intensity of a colour can exert sometimes dramatic impact on our expectations. So it may appear to taste and um, taste better and be more intense. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of kids' um, products or food products know this, so they purposely add more colouring to um, to yogurts, to food, because you know, oh no, I want the pink one, I don't want that one, that's one, yeah. So texture is another thing. So texture is the property of food or beverage that is felt in the mouth and can uh, and contributes to the flavour along with the taste, vision and other sensations. They actually did a study on, um, you know, I think it's Doritos or what it is, you know, corn chips. And they worked out that even though they could produce the flavour without, you know, that sensation on your fingers, you know, that the orange dust that comes off, you actually don't need it. Right. It, it they just did it and people go, it doesn't taste the same, even though it tastes exactly the same. So they just put it on there because they know it sells. So texture is the property of food or beverage that is felt in the mouth and contributes to the flavour along with the taste, vision and other sensations. So if we know that chips are supposed to be crunchy, if we get a soft one, we're less likely to see it as being, you know, the right texture or, you know, flavour or whatever. Um, all right, so first, the texture of the food we eat helps determine how much of its surface can come into contact with our taste receptors. The length of time food spends in the mouth also affects how strong its flavour seems. So let's say, for example, um, you know, mashed potato, it takes less time to eat the mashed potato than what it would to eat a chip. Because mashed potato, you know, is soft, it's going to spend less time in your mouth, so it's not going to be as flavoursome. However, if you eat a chip, because you have to chew it constantly, right, in order to get it down, it spends more time in your in your mouth, which means that it is going to be perceived as being, you know, as it'll take longer to actually uh, taste, and it's pretty much going to be perceived as being better or a whole lot worse. So synesthesia is a fun one. So synesthesia is a perceptual experience in which stimulation of one sense produces additional unusual experiences in another sense. So those people who have synesthesia, and it's rare, um, they'll look at, you know, letters or numbers and they might attribute a colour to them, right? So, for example, when they happen to see the alphabet, they'll see... A as orange or B as green. Um, and some of you may say, oh, but I do that too. Not to the extent of um, people with synesthesia do. If you, it also happens with music, if you happen to be playing, you know, a musical instrument and you play a note, they might actually see, um, you know, colours or they might get a taste sensation. Um, I met a guy who was a drummer and every single time that he used to hit certain um, a certain piece of the drum kit, he used to have this flavour sensation. And it's not just a, oh, I, I suddenly taste, you know, strawberries or whatever. It was intense. And, you know, 
He's got, oh my god, I don't know what happened. And it only happened when he played the drums. It was very weird. So synesthesia is involuntary, so you may want to highlight that word, and occurs automatically in response to the relevant sensory stimulation. It is extremely difficult to suppress. Like I said before, it's intense. They cannot stop it. The experience is vivid and highly memorable and consistent across time. For example, the synesthete always associates the same colour with the same number, letter of the alphabet or sound, right, every single time. And that is it. Make sure you do the learning activities. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. And we have some videos. I strongly recommend you give them a go.